Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Uh, you, you'll be glad I didn't try and do a solo there. Um, I have no formal announcements, but I have two things that I'm very happy about. Um, first of all, I'm really happy that Rob is back. Normal service has been resumed, um, and hopefully the PowerPoint will go really well. And the second thing I'm really happy about is we have our friend Norman Hamilton back again for another week. So um, you're all very welcome to the service, either watching online later on today or uh, um, this morning. But Norman, we look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you. Well, good morning, everybody. Everybody is awake. And thank you, Peter, for your ever warm welcome. I don't think you'll ever live next last Sunday morning down, but at least, at least it leaves me with a happy memory. Sorry, one of many happy memories of being at Lodeds, that uh, one of the most senior computer guys in Ireland <laughs> didn't know which button to press on the computer. But there we are. That's, that's, that's what happens when you become a manager. You lose the skills. <laughs> I think maybe I better stop this. You lose the skills of the apprentice. <laughs> right, we are all very welcome in the Lord's presence, and uh, I, I, I am of the view that church is to be enjoyed and not endured. Uh, the Bible is clear, at least the psalmist is clear, <clears throat> that we, need, we come to sing a new song each time we come to worship. And for many of us, coming on a Sunday morning is what we do on a Sunday morning, week in, week out. And it's a routine, and it's easy to slide into thinking, yeah, we're just turned up in church, we're glad to be here, but actually we're not really expecting anything new from God. So we'll just take a wee moment just to settle ourselves and try and tune ourselves, knowing that God is here and wants us to sing a new song because he has new things to bring to us. Let's take a moment just to pray together. <clears throat> Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, praise his name. Proclaim his salvation day after day. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. And Lord, we want that to be our, mot our motivation here this morning. We haven't come just out of duty or out of routine. We've come because you are worthy of our praise and our worship. And you have been gracious to us and invite us to bring that worship and praise. So as we do that, we pray we will be doing it with a, a new enthusiasm, a new expectation of God as we meet together at the beginning of this new week, in Jesus' name. Amen. Holy, holy, holy.
Well, let's follow it up as we pray together. Our Father, it is such a privilege, such a delight to be able to come and worship the holy God of eternity. Lord, we find it hard to take in just what it means for you to be holy. With no taint of sin, no forgetfulness, no loneliness, no waywardness, no confusion, no ambiguity. Lord, you know that when we look at your holiness, our own lives are such pale reflections of that. You know what troubles us. You know how we think, how we feel. You know what affects us well and affects us badly. You know what lifts us up and drags us down. You know what makes us confused, fearful or anxious, as well as joyful and grateful. And Lord, even in the past week, many of us will have had many of those emotions and those experiences. Every week, things happen, life happens, and we have to live it in the very limited light that we have. So, Lord, we come this morning to be refreshed by the Spirit of God, to be uplifted, to be encouraged, to be strengthened, maybe even to be rebuked and made to think. Lord, we have come with a purpose, and we want to honor the purpose that you have brought us here for. And for each and for all of us, those will be a bit different. So, Lord, we don't, <clears throat> we don't come idly. We don't come nonchalantly. We don't wander in here. We come because you have invited us and you've brought us here. And we want to see what you have in store for us as we meet together here this morning. So, Lord, speak to our minds, uplift our souls, warm our hearts. Give us delight at the privilege we have on this Sunday morning. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. There is, there is one slide. What's the word on the screen? What's the word on the screen? How many of you saw the word evil? Put your hand up. One, two, three. Many saw the word good. Now, isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? And that's the point that I want to make. You've made it yourselves. Has, by the way, has everybody seen the word evil? Hands up who hasn't seen the word evil. It is there. It is there. Uh, and this is really a very simple point I want to make, not only to the children, but to, but to everybody else. It all depends how you look at it. The, um, what we see immediately is the word good. And yet when you look carefully, you see the exact opposite. Well, I'm really sorry. Oh, yes, you guys can see it there. The Bible has a very interesting verse in the book of Isaiah. It reads this. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. Woe to those who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet 
and sweet for bitter. And I think you've made the point yourselves even more easily and quickly than I expected that we often just look at something and our first reaction is what we think is the right one. But actually, there may be something else there that we haven't seen. And it takes us a wee while to figure it out. Really interesting just watching, watching you talk with each other where you were leaning over and saying, and saying look, do you see in the, in the G, do you see the word uh, E or the letter E? You were explaining to each other a wee bit as to where the evil was <clears throat> in, on the screen. And I want to say to the children, those of you at school, and to those of us who are a wee bit older, some of us who are very older like me, <clears throat> that there are an awful lot of people <clears throat> who simply want us to, to take on board what they say as being right and good and true, when actually it might not be. It's really easy to be taken in <clears throat> by people who shout loudly or who have very strong opinions and actually <clears throat> what they say, what they believe, what they want us to do is not good. It is, <clears throat> excuse me, it is not what God would want us to do or the way God would want us to think. And I'll come back to this uh, in, in a few minutes' time when we look at, at Scripture. But I want to say to the children, I want to say to the adults, it's really, really important not to believe everything that people tell you, not to believe everything that you see on the television. My mother used to say, it's, you know, it must be true because I saw it in black and white in the paper. Mm -hmm. Maybe not. Maybe not. People who are famous say things. Celebrities want us to follow, to follow them and do what they do and think what they think. Something is not true simply because people say it is. Something is not good simply because people say it is. And that is one of the reasons we come to church. That's one of the reasons we have the Bible. That's one of the reasons we pray, so that we will be able to figure out what God thinks is true, what God thinks is right, what God thinks is worthwhile, and not simply be led by the nose by people who think differently. So that um, slide on the screen is a reminder to us on a Sunday morning that we need to be very, very aware of the, of the importance of separating out what is good from what is evil. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you are holy. You are holy, holy, holy. That you are perfect, that you are pure. And Lord, we want to plug into that whether we're the youngest or the oldest here this morning. We want to take on your mind to think things the way you think about them, to live the way you want us to live, and not to be led astray by those who call evil things good or who call sweet things bitter who call things that are wrong to be true. Lord, you know the challenge that is in school, in college, at work, wherever. We pray, Lord, that we will always hold fast to what is good in your eyes and turn away from what is evil. And we pray in Jesus' name. And one of the reasons we make a distinction between good and evil is because Jesus loves us.
As I was watching the news last night, maybe like many of you, I asked myself, how on earth do you pray for climate change? I find that a really difficult question to answer because there is so much that's going on, so many factors, the companies, the politicians, the people in mega distress across the world, even the folks on holiday in Greece or southern Spain, how on earth do we pray in an era of rampant climate change? So on the basis that I don't know how to do it, I'm going to try and do it with us. And because the reason we pray at all is because we are always out of our depth in almost everything we pray for. That is why we pray, because we are not in control. So let's pray. <clears throat> Lord, we're very conscious how limited our prayers are. We're limited, so limited in our understanding. So limited in figuring out what the causes of things are. 
and we feel so powerless to do anything about so many things, whether they're things that are happening in us or to us or around us, locally, in our families, never mind things that are happening on a, a grand worldwide scale. <clears throat> And so, Lord, in the inadequacy of our praying, we come to pray. And we come to you humbly and earnestly because you are the God of the nations. You are the God who made not only the earth, but the cosmos. You are the God who cares about every individual on this planet. You are the God who intervened in Christ to bring salvation. And Lord, we want to call on you as best we can, no matter how inadequately we do it, to rescue our world. And we have seen even already the the battle between good and evil. We're very aware of many, many forces in our world that are driven by greed and corruption and self-interest and power. And we find it really hard to pray against them because we barely understand the scale and the reach of evil in your world. But Lord, because you are holy, we want to pray for our world and we want to plead with you to strengthen the arm and the ability and the opportunity for people who are doing your will to prevail. We want to pray, Lord, for restraint on corrupting our world with gases and poisons. We want to pray for those who are genuinely concerned to make your world a better place for people whom you've made. We want to pray that you will strengthen them, whether they're in the United Nations, or whether they're in big conferences, or whether they're governments or individuals, that what is right and good will prevail. And Lord, even at a personal level, at a local level, we pray that we will not just simply shrug our shoulders and pass the responsibility on to others, but that even though we can't fix anything, that we will play our part in not making it worse. We want to pray particularly for organizations that are working to bring healing and help and care and support to those in dire, dire need. Whether it's the aid agencies like Tear Fund or Oxfam or Christian Aid, in areas that are devastated by floods or drought. We want to pray for people locally here from Ireland, from the UK, who are working in these dreadful conditions, that you will watch over not only their work, but them personally and their families at home. We want to pray for the Church of Jesus Christ in places where there is devastation as they have to share in the devastation and yet at the same time seek to minister and care not only for their own members but for their neighbors, for refugees, for families, for all sorts of people coming their way. We pray that the Church of Christ will grow in places of dreadful distress and need. 
And Lord, we do want to pray it a very, in a very straightforward way for those who this morning are dealing with forest fires and wildfires and, in, and unbearable heat, whether they are firefighters or security forces battling day and night to keep others safe. We want to pray for them in the work they're doing this day. We do not take their work for granted. And Lord, we want to pray for those who are terrified this morning for whatever reason, having fear of losing their homes and we already have lost them or their livelihoods or their livestock. We know nothing Lord, of the scale of this or of the impact of this over generations. And we pray, Lord, for compassion and mercy on a grand scale where it is needed. And Lord, as we pray on the big picture, we want to pray on the local picture. We want as a church family to pray for those who are known to us who are in real need this day whatever that shape that need is, whether it's material or spiritual or physical or mental or emotional, whatever. Whether it's in relationships that have broken down or loneliness that isolates, gripped by fear, whatever. We want to bring them urgently and gently to you in our prayers right now. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. And Lord, for ourselves, in whatever state we're in, whatever situation we're in, whether it's a good place or a not very good place, we ask again that we will be found faithful in honouring you, even in the midst of the circumstances in which we find ourselves. Lord, we want to thank you too for all the good things that we enjoy. The food on our tables, the relative calm of our climate, the freedom to come here on a Sunday morning, the privilege of joining digitally during the week through the recording, we want to thank you for what you make available to us. And so, Lord, again, in our weakness, we come to you with confidence in the name of Jesus. Amen. I'm thinking of uh, climate change and the like. He who has held the oceans in his hands. Let's worship God. <coughs>
Robert will have the scripture reading in the sermon, so you can move on to the first slide. Thank you. I hope you believe me when I say that it's been a, a real delight to be with you over the, the, the past couple of weeks. Um, it's almost like coming home in a sense, having got to know you a bit during the vacancy. Uh, and so thank you for having me and thank you to David for the invitation. It's been a real delight to bring some guidance from the Bible on the whole question of encouraging one another in the Lord and the importance of doing that regularly, doing it on an ongoing basis. This morning, I want to sort of wrap up uh, our wee mini-series on encouragement to offer some thoughts from Scripture and, if I may, to recap on some of the main ingredients of encouragement that we've seen over the past couple of weeks. The importance of every believer taking the ministry of encouragement seriously was highlighted to me in a leading article in one of our big national newspapers this week. It had, this was the headline, Britain is no country for Christians. And then the strap line there, the suspension of a Tory councillor simply for tweeting a verse from Scripture. And the article then went on to list a whole series of incidents over the past number of months in which Christian people have been taken to task. They've been harassed or sanctioned in some way simply because they stood up for what you and I would regard as straightforward historical biblical Christian teaching. Things they, and particular threats to their jobs and their livelihoods. And I have to say, it was really quite a scary read. Britain is no country for Christians. Now here in Northern Ireland, we're not quite in that quagmire yet. But I think that will come. Because as we're becoming more secularized, we are specifically becoming more anti-Christian. Now, I'm not a scaremonger. I, I'm an optimist by nature. I don't see, as it were, reds under the beds all the time. But I think I am suggesting that as the secular agenda, the aggressive secular agenda develops, we will need to put on the armor of God to face into the future. Let me remind you, what Paul said about that. Put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil, back to that word again, when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist with the breastplate of righteousness doing what is right in the eyes of God in place with your feet fitted with the gospel of peace in addition to that to this take up the shield of faith faith not crossing your fingers Take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. The Apostle Paul was under no illusions of the pressures that would come virtually in his generation. And they've come in virtually every generation since. And they're in this generation. And without in any way being scaremongering, I think those pressures are increasing and will continue to increase. And I think as we saw last week, being sleepy or indifferent or apathetic won't cut it. We had a, a slide up uh, that I've used a couple of times 
The devil is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. So against this background, encouragement matters, and it matters a lot. It matters a lot to give it, and it matters a lot to receive it. And it'll matter even more, I suggest, month by month, year by year, over the next wee while. So I want to sort of wrap things up with what I might call some scaffolding to put round the calling to be an encourager and to be on the receiving end of encouragement. Now, I, I generally, in fact, all, rarely, rarely have uh, built my talks around words that all begin with the same letter. But I'm going to break the habit of a lifetime. And we're going to have four, not three, because three is Presbyterian. We're going to have four, and they all begin with the letter I. These are things that I need to do. I need to take on board. I need to. The first one is this. Do it intentionally. Don't be haphazard about being an encourager. A few weeks ago at the beginning of this wee series, I spoke about my friend who had decided to bring the practice of respair back into everyday conversation. For those of you who weren't here a couple of weeks ago, respair is the opposite of despair. He had decided quite intentionally to bring encouragement and light and hope back into everyday language and the way he sets about living every day. Because he says we all need it. And I have taken personally his advice on board, which is part of the reason actually that I'm sharing this series of three with you. And I am finding it both a challenge as well as a delight to be actively encouraging others day in, day out. And as we saw a couple of weeks ago, the Bible is quite explicit, quite explicit about the need to be intentional in encouragement. Hebrews 3, encourage one another daily. Do it. Encourage one another daily, not on a haphazard occasional now and then basis. Paul and Thessalonians, therefore encourage one another. Build each other up, just as in fact you are doing. Encouragement is not an optional add-on, an occasional something we do. It is to be, biblically, it is to be intentional. That's what I need to do. Here's the second thing I need to do. I need to back it up with integrity. Titus 2 is a very interesting verse. In everything, set an example by doing what is good. Back to this good evil thing again. Set an example by doing what is good. In your teaching, show integrity, seriousness, and soundness of speech that cannot be condemned. Hmm. My language matters. Soundness of speech. So that those who oppose you, and they are many, may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about us. Now, increasingly, of course, people are not ashamed of anything. Anything, no matter what it is. But nonetheless, the New Testament is clear. Integrity matters. There's virtually no part of our modern society where integrity is not, or has not, or is not being questioned or brought into disrepute. No part. Politicians at every level, from local councillor to prime minister. Recently, you may have followed the story in, uh, in Dublin, uh, in RTE, and the scandal in RTE which has led to massive changes underway. Integrity 
just had disappeared. You may well be aware of banks exploiting their customers, and that's no reference to Nigel Farage. Public servants of many and many kinds. And yes, we need to face up to it. The Church of Jesus Christ is no stranger to scandal and wrongdoing. And that makes it ever more difficult to be a witness to Jesus Christ with integrity. So we need to be intentional. I need to have integrity through and through in my life. Proverbs 10 puts it like this. Whoever walks in integrity walks securely. Lovely confident statement that, isn't it? I have nothing to fear. I have no skeletons in my cupboard. I am transparent and open. I have nothing to hide. Whoever walks in integrity walks securely. But whoever takes crooked paths will be found out. Be sure your sin will find you out. And those lovely words from Jesus in, in Matthew, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. I love these words, and I know I'm no angel. Whoever walks in integrity walks securely. Being intentional, having integrity. Third thing, focus on what's important. Isn't it all too easy to focus on anything but the Lord? Easy to talk about the church. Easy to have negative chatter about what's going on in politics. Isn't to be easy to be negative about some person or some tricky situation? Rampant, rampant cynicism and skepticism about everything. A friend of mine, um, uh, who's a very senior journalist in England, was invited, in fact, was headhunted to on a on what he described to me as an eye-watering salary eye-watering, well into six figures, to become the producer of a very cynical TV show. He declined. Christian guy, he declined because he did not want to be part of promoting cynicism and skepticism and mockery and claimed to be a Christian at the same time. Encouragement of the Lord won't come through endless discussions about cul-de-sacs or rubbish or trivia. Here you have Titus 3 again. Avoid, avoid foolish controversies, genealogies, and arguments and quarrels about the law. In other words, we're there's all the things that are written in the Bible and you can get into all sorts of it says here, it says this, it says that and you can argue about them avoid them because they are unprofitable and useless and warn a divisive person once and warn them a second time after that, leave it this is really interesting don't get into the business of being associated with people who are continually skeptical, cynical, because they're bad for your soul. You need to get that on board. Don't join them in the party. Focus on what is important. And then the final thing that I need to take on board don't underestimate the impact that encouragement can have. I want to read a passage, this passage from Romans 16. I suspect, though I can't be sure of this, obviously, 
I suspect it has never been read as a Sunday morning in Lone Ends or in any congregation. Now, I may be wrong on that. I'm happy to be corrected on that, but I suspect not. Because in this passage, Paul appreciates and sets out his indebtedness to very, very ordinary people he had come across in the course of his life. This is a passage that is ignored, usually, and yet we need to bear in mind that it is in the Bible for a reason. It's not just put in as a sort of add-on on a Tuesday afternoon when Paul was writing his letter. Let me read it to you carefully. This is Paul writing to the church in Rome. And he finishes his letter, which is a very substantial one, with this. I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a deacon of the church in Cancrea. I ask you to receive her in the Lord in a way worthy of his people and to give her any help she may need from you for she has been the benefactor of many people, including me. A good woman. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my co-workers in Christ Jesus. They risked their lives for me. Not only I, but all the churches of the Gentiles are grateful to them. Greet also the church that meets in their home. Greet my dear friend, Eponetus, who was the first convert to Christ in the province of Asia. Think of the encouragement that he was. Greet Mary, who worked very hard for you. Greet Andronicus and Junia, my fellow Jews, who have been in prison with me. They are outstanding among the apostles. And they were in Christ before I was. Great Ampliatus, my dear friend in the Lord. Great Urbanus, our co-worker in Christ, and my dear friend Stachus. Greet Apelles, whose fidelity to Christ has stood the test. We know nothing about almost all of these people. Nothing at all. But yet, they were the sources of encouragement by who they were, what they did, sometimes in extremely trying circumstances, to encourage the Apostle Paul. Now let me, I hope gently but firmly, do a checklist. How many people do you know who are the benefactors of other people? We're going back to these verses who give generously of what they have to many people. You might not know, of course, and that's fair enough. But you probably can't think of very many. How many people do you know who will risk their lives for others, apart from those who are in the armed forces? But they'll take a, even take a risk on your behalf. Never mind risking their lives. Many people know we take a risk to stand by you. How many people would you describe as dear friends in the Lord? Just mentioned a number of times. Eponetus, Ampliatus, Stachus. How many people in your circle of friends would you regard as dear friends in the Lord? Probably not very many. Many people do you know who are like Mary, who worked very hard for you? 
probably a few. Adronicus and Junior, outstanding. How many people do you know who are outstanding followers of Christ? How many people do you know whose fidelity to Christ has stood the test, like this unknown saint Apelles? My guess is, and I've done this for myself, not a lot. In some cases, hardly any. But when we turn it around, it gets tougher still, doesn't it? How many people do you think would describe you in the Lord as the benefactor of many people? Many people would describe me as taking a risk for me. Or me taking a risk for them. Many people would describe you as their dear friend in the Lord. Very, very few would tell you that. How many people do you think would say you were outstanding as a follower of Christ? Many people would look at you and say, your faithfulness to Christ has stood the test. I find this a really, not just interesting, but quite a troubling, stirring chapter. Because here was Paul, with all the trials he had been through, the things he had done, where he had been, giving public thanks to ordinary people for the encouragement they had been to him. I think the message is self-evident. Our opening slide was challenging and rewarding. Being an encourager, being a bringer of respair, being a giver of respair, is not, to coin a phrase, Christian rocket science. It is straightforward, it is demanding, but it is a delight. And yet it's often neglected. And as I suggested at the beginning, becoming ever more needed. I've already mentioned my colleague, Methodist minister, who decided that he wanted to put respair back into his vocabulary and into his living. And it's, I think the scriptures are clear just how important that is if we are to be faithful, productive, contented witnesses to Christ day and daily. I've asked the Lord to make it really important to me and over the last three weeks and this morning, I'm saying, do you think it's important to you as well? And to help you think it out again, the uh, six slides that we've seen, I have copies of them. I nearly ran out of um, giving about last week. I've actually printed a few more this week. Uh, so... I think the rain will be over. Hope it will be over. If you would like one with these six slides, do ask for me. Do ask it for me as we go over to the hall. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for bringing us here. Thank you for the encouragement it is to be together. And for those who are joining us on the recording later, we would pray that they too would know that they matter in the life of this congregation. And that whatever situation they are in, that they would be able to be encouragers themselves to the folks around them, if at all possible. We don't want anybody, Lord, to be discouraged, to be isolated, to be left out. And so, Lord, we invite your Spirit to do in us personally, in our families, 
in our congregations, we invite you to turn us all into being encouragers and to be delighted and willing to be on the receiving end of encouragement. Take down the walls that prevent that. Give us the desire and the courage and show us the delight and the blessing it is in Jesus' name. The last hymn is, again, quite an interesting one, and thank you for choosing it. O church, arise. Church, arise and put your armor on in the call of Christ our captain. For now the weak and say that they are strong, the strength that God has given, with shield of faith and belt of truth, we stand against the devil's lies. An army bold. But a bride's love reaching out to those in darkness. Our call to war, to love the captive soul, but to rage against the captor, and with the sword that makes a wounded whole, we will fight with faith and love. I'm looking forward to my coffee across the uh, across in the hall. Do join us. We'll give thanks for that as we finish. Our Father, thank you for the encouragement of simply being here this morning. And as we head into a new week, not knowing what it may hold for us, we pray that encouragement and uplift and courage itself, resilience and strength and wisdom will be given to us by your Spirit. We thank you, too, for the blessings of this day. We thank you for the, the tea, the coffee, the fellowship in the hall. We do not take that for granted either. And we invite you just to surround each and every one of us and those joining us on the recording with your grace, your mercy, and your blessing. In Jesus' name.